a new policy, how the Pentagon is making it easier for troops to have an abortion, signs of weakness, why a new study on the U.S. military's readiness for battle is causing some concern, tightening his grip, analysis of China's communist meetings and why they were good for President Xi, and change of direction. We hear from a pro-life doctor who used to perform abortions. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, October 21st, 2022. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Eric Rosales in for Tracy Sable. We begin with a developing story. The U.S. House Committee investigating the January 6 riots formally subpoenaed former President Donald Trump today, demanding he testify. Also today, former Trump advisor Steve Bannon was sentenced to four months in prison for defying a subpoena from the same committee. In other news, the Pentagon says that it will provide travel funds and support for military members seeking an abortion. The provision applies even to troops stationed in places such as in Texas and even Florida, where most abortions are illegal. The White House wants the policy in place by the end of the year. Well, a bad grade and an unwelcome first for the U.S. military earlier this week. In its annual review of U.S. military strength, the Heritage Foundation rated U.S. forces as, quote, weak. The study examines everything from the size of the U.S. fleet to recent recruitment numbers. It's the only non-governmental annual assessment of U.S. military readiness. Well, standing in stark contrast to the reports of the struggling U.S. military is the country of China. Yeah, the country now boasts the world's largest navy, and President Xi was re-elected this week during the country's communist uh, uh, congress. He said that he wants to strengthen the military even more and also refused to renounce the U.S. or the use of force against Taiwan. Let's now check in with Gordon Chang, author of The Coming Collapse of China and the Great U.S.-China Tech War. Gordon, always a pleasure to have you here with us. Let's get right to it. President Xi was just reelected and has, to, has a determined agenda, especially when it comes to Taiwan and even beyond that. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, his biggest applause line on Sunday when he gave his work report to the 20th National Congress was that history demanded that the People's Republic of China absorb Taiwan. And, and I think that's a real indication that Xi Jinping is going to do this soon. You know, we have heard these estimates from the Pentagon that China would move on Taiwan somewhere, well, maybe 2027, 2035. But, you know, on uh, Wednesday, we heard from the chief of naval operations, Admiral Mike Gilday, the chief naval officer, that uh, this could be this year or next year. So wow. we've got to be concerned that there is very much a sense that Xi Jinping will move a lot sooner than we think. And to that end, also military growth and readiness are his top priorities. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, I think that he believes that uh, this is a situation where the Navy and the U.S. forces in general need to be ready to, as he said, fight tonight. Um, and so, therefore, he is going to send his ships out with full loads of missiles to be prepared to fight. Um, and, and I think that that's absolutely essential right now, because we have seen all of these hostile statements from Xi Jinping, and not just during the 20th National Congress, but we've also seen him with this rapid military buildup, mm. but even more ominously, is getting the Chinese civilians ready for battle. So this is an all-society, all-regime effort to get China ready to go. And in the meantime, we uh, see very poor grades for the U.S. military back here at home, especially when it comes to strength and recruitment. This is a concern, is it not? It is, because I think the, um, I mean, most Americans think their military is a lot stronger than it actually is. And there have been all sorts of troubling developments. You know, the Pentagon has a large budget, so it's not an issue of money. It's the issue of where they're spending the money and their priorities. And they have made some really serious mistakes, including the Navy, which has had trouble building ships. Um, China doesn't seem to have that problem. They're turning out ships faster than we can count them. So right now, um, we're at a point where we are, we are at a point where I think the Navy is not in a position to deal as effectively with China as most Americans assume it would. 
Yeah, Gordon, you know, I'm the Capitol Hill correspondent for EWTN News Nightly, and up on Capitol Hill, we're still waiting for the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, to pass Congress. Uh, that's got to be concerning, does it not? Yes, especially because in a high inflation era, era that we're now in, the budget is probably going to be effectively smaller, um, get, given the effect of inflation. And right now, at a time where China is pouring more and more money into its military and getting its civilians ready for war, um, you know, we have had a Pentagon, at least uh, over the last several months, that seemed to lack a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. So that's why Admiral Gilday's comments on Wednesday were really so important, because it showed that, event that finally, at least the Navy has woken up. And we had some comments that, uh, concern comments that were voiced by Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee when she warned about the Chinese Communist Party expanding its surveillance state. What do you make of that? Well, China is no longer authoritarian, as everyone calls it. It really is totalitarian. It has, depending on who you talk to, somewhere between 540 and 600, uh, 626 million surveillance cameras. It has the nationwide social credit system, which is putting together the Great Firewall, which is the most sophisticated set of Internet controls anywhere. And the Communist Party has millions, maybe even tens of millions of neighborhood minders. So this is a surveillance state which has really gone beyond anything that we have seen. In related news, I want to also mention the recent headline regarding China recruiting even former British military pilots to train their own pilots. Have you heard anything about this, and what's your reaction to it all? This is really distressing because, you know, although China can build planes, um, it really needs experienced pilots. And the, the RAF pilots that are now helping to train China are m helping them bridge that critical gap. Um, this should not be permitted. Um, and, of course, there are now moves in the U.K. to uh, prohibit this. Um, but this has come too late. Um, so what we really need to do is make sure that there is no Western or any other uh, assistance to the Chinese military, because we can't make that Chinese military configured to kill Americans stronger than it already is. And talk to us, if you can, Jordan, a little bit about, uh, Gordon, that is a little bit about how our economy has a direct effect on China's economy and also how China's economy continues to grow, does it not? Well, China right now is at a very difficult position internally because of the debt crisis. Um, it didn't have a downturn in 2008 because it embarked on the biggest stimulus program in history. And now the Chinese economy is exhausted. And we mm. see this with the debt defaults of the big property developers, the so-called mortgage boycotts, where people are not paying their mortgages to the banks, uh, the bank runs. Um, and it's not just that. It's, it's also problems in the export sector, the COVID lockdowns. So I think China's economy right now is contracting. A really serious sign was that for the first time ever, the National Bureau of Statistics postponed indefinitely the reporting of third quarter and September trade and economic numbers. I think that that's a real indication that they are very poor. And Gordon, tell us what other stories you're following. Well, right now, um, China's uh, repeating of Russia's uh, threats to use its nuclear weapons is very concerning. Um, Beijing has been unofficially doing that through its uh, media posters for the last three weeks. That's a real indication of not just that China is all in supporting the Russian war effort, but also really that uh, China is uh, trying to destabilize the world because it's been making its own threats to use nuclear weapons, something that it ramped up beginning in July of last year, uh, although we have heard them before that. So um, we've got to be concerned that either Russia or China will release nuclear weapons in a war fighting situation. And what this is doing is it's affecting Kim Jong-un of North Korea hmm. because not only the Chinese and the Russians, but now the North Koreans are making threats for the first use of their most destructive weapons. Well, Gordon Chang, I got to tell you, your insight is always a pleasure. A pleasure to have you here with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. Coming up, a priest from EWTN Ukraine tells us about his work amid a war with Russia.
Welcome back. We want to let you know about an EWTN correspondent in Cuba. He has been summoned for a government interrogation. Adrian Martinez Cadiz posted the summons on social media last week, and he says that if he does not appear, he faces a fine and can even be accused of contempt. Adrian is now asking for your prayers. The gathering in Rome of EWTN employees from around the world ended today with a workshop on technology. The workshop was part of a three-day meeting of 70 EWTN employees. Other discussions focused on the future of the network and its mission for church renewal. And joining us now from Rome is Father Oleksandr Zelinsky, Director General of EWTN Ukraine. Father, thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell us more about the meetings in Rome and what stood out the most to you? Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a very good meeting, uh, international meeting of affiliate, EWTN affiliates. And uh, we met as family and we felt also this atmosphere of of family. I think that this is meeting when uh, we uh, had occasion to listen, to also to learn, uh, also to unite between us. This is very important for, our, for us. Beautiful. Switching gears now, let's, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing in Ukraine amid the war in Russia. Talk to us about that. As EWTN uh, office, as EWTN uh, Ukraine uh, team, we continue our uh, work. Uh, now we still working in Kiev, uh, where we had uh, the everyday broadcasting of masses of of prayers. So we produce a documentary, for example. Now we produce different uh, programs. Uh, so even uh, uh, during the the war, we still continue to to work. Yes, we. Mm -hmm. We feel some fear, especially uh, during the different alarms. Uh, and uh, last week was so dangerous also in, in Kiev. But, um, but at the same time, we try to trust in God. We try to continue our, our work. Uh, we try to, uh, to serve uh, uh, during this, uh, this mission which, which God gives us. And we, we believe that he will also protect us uh, during uh, this mission. Well, I tell you what, our prayers uh, from all of us here in the States go out to you, but talk to us more about the situation in the capital and how you're helping the faithful there on the ground. Uh, yeah, as EWTN Ukraine, where I uh, especially work now, uh, we try to help our people, uh, first of all, spiritually and uh, uh, through broadcasting, through different uh, product uh, content which we do uh, this is our mission to uh, to spread the the good news to spread the god's love to help people to trust in god and especially in this moment in the moment of war yes really this is not easy time for us many people uh, fear uh, feel fear sometimes panic but uh, at the same time uh, we are uh, invited by God, I believe, to to help people, to be with them, to, to serve them. And uh, we try to do it as uh, EWTN, uh, Ukraine's uh, team. May our Heavenly Father continue to put a shield of protection around all of you. Father Oleksandr Zelinsky, Director General of EWTN Ukraine, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much. Up next, a pro-life congressman from Ohio takes us inside his re-election campaign. Plus, a former pro-abortion doctor tells us why he is now pro-life. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI says Vatican II was not only meaningful, but necessary. The Pope Emeritus uh, made the observations in a new nearly four-page letter. It includes fresh observations from one of the few remaining theologians who participated in the council. The letter was addressed to the Franciscan University of Steubenville. The Ohio School is hosting a conference examining Pope Benedict XVI's work. Now to see the letter for yourself from Pope Emeritus, uh, visit our news partners, catholicnewsagency.com. 
The November 8th midterm elections are fast approaching at state control of Congress, including the U.S. House of Representatives. Republican Congressman Bob Lotta, a Catholic, is running for re-election in Ohio's 5th Congressional District. I recently sat down with Congressman Lotta at his home parish, St. Thomas More, in Bowling Green. We have to control inflation, cut, cut government spending, actually do a budget, actually do our appropriation bills, stop this craziness with all these continuing resolutions and omnibus at the end. If we would do our work, we wouldn't have these problems. Congressman Bob Lotta adds that out of control spending by Democrats and a lack of allowing oil drilling permits throughout the country have caused a big jump in energy prices, which affect manufacturing jobs in his district. Here in Northwest Ohio, and you know we have 86,000 uh, manufacturing jobs. We use a lot of energy, to, you know, so we have to have that energy to have jobs. And all of a sudden, it gets too expensive to uh, have that energy. The jobs are going to start disappearing. Congressman Lotta is the lead Republican on the Communications and Technology Subcommittee, and he tells me that getting broadband to rural areas is the key to their economic success. We need to make sure we have the broadband. We have to make sure that our rural communities uh, have it. Because again, if you don't have it today, you're not uh, communicating and you're not surviving. So we have a lot of work to do. One thing that does separate you from your opponent is your stance on pro-life. The issue of life is paramount and we've got to treat it as such. That's a human life that has to be treated as such and make sure that you do everything possible to save that life. And so that Born Alive bill, we want to make sure that that's one of our pieces that we want to move in the next Congress. In 2015, the congressman co-sponsored a resolution to amend the Constitution to ban same-sex marriage. He tells me the key to winning re-election is listening to voters. And that's a 24-hour commitment, a lesson he learned from his father, a former U.S. congressman. I believe in giving of myself to the people I represent. I think that's absolutely essential. And I was taught a long time ago, there's a difference between a public servant and a politician. A politician sees how much they can take from the people they represent for their own benefit, while a public servant gives us back to those people as much of themselves. Congressman Lotta's 5th Congressional District generates the most farm revenue in Ohio and has long been a Republican stronghold. But he tells me he's taking nothing for granted. And by the way, I'd like to thank Father Jeff Walker for allowing us to do the interview at St. Thomas More University Church. It is important to note that I did reach out to Congressman Lotta's opponent, Democrat Craig Schwartz, for an on-camera interview, but I never received a response to my emails. Well, a U.S. doctor says that he wanted to serve women and be the very best, and so he performed abortions. That is until one day things didn't go as planned. In a new book, Two Patients, Dr. John Bruchalski says the story of his, tells the story of his conversion from pro-abortion to pro-life and a lot more. He joins us now. Doctor, you're not only a OBGYN and the author of a new book, Two Patients, but thank you so much for joining us. Why did you write this book? Well, I found that, and by the way, thank you so much for this invitation. Um, I wrote the book because medicine and society seems to be in free fall. We're all lukewarm on this most tragic issue of taking the life of an innocent family member in the safe womb or the supposedly safe womb of its, um, of its mother. And it was not only the free fall, but it's God's mercy, how his mercy really tracked me through my misery mm. to bring me to a place of wholeness. And I've seen it now in so, you know, tens of thousands of my patients who are women. And there's real hope in providing a real alternative to abortion as good medicine. That's why I wrote it. Wonderful. Let's, let's dive directly into this story. You performed abortions during your residency, and then one day a moment of truth happened. What exactly happened? So I really believe that my mom and dad formed me very well in the Catholic faith. However, I can't say the same for my high school and college Catholic education during the 70s and 80s. So here I was buying into the, you know, the status quo that abortion is needed for happiness and wholeness. And for the first two years of my residency, that's what I did. I gave women what they wanted. So there I was one night and in one room because the mom wanted the baby, I did everything in my medically human power 
to help save and keep that baby inside of her. Hmm. In the other room, separated by a six-inch wall, the mother didn't want the child, and therefore, at the same gestational age, the fetuses, the babies, the unborn humans were the same. Hmm. And yet, because one mom wanted, one mom didn't, I broke her water and induced labor to end the pregnancy. Well, I didn't take a good history because the mother didn't want it, and I was just doing what she wanted. I then put it on a scale, and I had to call the neonatal intensive care doctors. And lo and behold, buddy, a wonderful Catholic woman, physician, NICU doctor, neonatal intensive care, walked in and said, hey, John, you have to stop treating my patients like tumors. Wow. She surveyed the room. She knew what I did. And then she said, uh, you're better than this. Women need better than this. Let's have coffee tomorrow. <laughs> and it was wow. that cognitive dissonance between, separated by that wall. Now, can you imagine, you know, God's sense of humor? I was working at an evangelical pregnancy center at night, like hmm. an assembly of God church mm -hmm. that believed that there, you could provide an alternative so not only did I have the dissonance of two patients, you know, dictated by a mother's desire, but I was beginning to see that there was another option besides abortion on demand. Amen to that. Well, you say that this defining moment professionally also led to a defining moment spiritually. I'm sure that there's also been an element of forgiving yourself there. Can you tell us more of that, that journey? Oh, that is so... Once again, Bud, you have your finger on the pulse, again, of your audience. So many of us who've suffered the trauma of abortion, whether it's the provider, the doctor, or the mother, or the family, or the siblings, because those ripple effects really move through society and keep us in shame and anger, especially when we're told it's not supposed to mean that much. Well, I can tell you that two years earlier at Guadalupe, I heard a voice that said, why are you hurting me? And I blew it off. You know that line, if today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts? Well, I did that. Yeah. Every abortion I did hardened my heart. And yet, when that doctor the next morning suggested that I go to Medjugorje to find peace, mm. well, my mother two days later did the same thing. I went, and it was there that in prayer, I found the love and sacrifice and mercy, the word beloved, mm. moved from the sacred and immaculate hearts into my heart. And instantly, I knew my leprosy was real. I wanted to ask forgiveness. And I believe that it was the intercessory prayer of my parents and so many people in your audience who prayed for conversion on this issue helped me uh, back in 1989 um, fall to the ground, allow the Lord and Our Lady to work in my life. And once you touch God's mercy, uh, sir, there is no going back, but you're loved. And every time you begin to go back to the victimization of yourself and, oh, the justification or the shame, his mercy frees you for his love. And when that fills you, just like the visitation, you got to go share it with people. So I came off the hill, went back home, and uh, the mother said, Johnny, practice excellent medicine, see the underserved daily, and follow the teachings of my son's church and faith and tradition. And that's what we've been doing ever since. The Tepeyac OBGYN Center has been there for 28 years now. Well, I tell you, uh, you know, you, you're bringing me to tears right now. Uh, oh. Dr. John Bruchalski, thank you so much. The author of the book, Two Patients, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless. God bless. I want to thank you so much for watching tonight from the entire EWTN News Nightly team. I'm Eric Rosales. Have yourself a good night and God bless.